Hello, 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 and thank you for checking out the Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. Today, I'm joined by the boss of a company that brought us the Bacon and Beer Classic, Taco Takeover, and Wild West Adventures, Seltzerland. If you haven't heard of these events, they are massive events. They host tens of thousands of people, and they are incredibly fun. Uh, they're fun, they're silly, and everybody has a real, like, a hardcore blast of them. And one of the things that, that is uh, most interesting to me about them is that they are literally in sports stadiums. I actually got to work one of them one time in Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York. So without further delay, please welcome the head of Cannonball Productions, Kate Levenstein. Welcome to the show, Kate Levenstein. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that you were able to to come on the show. Um, you know, it's uh, companies like yours are, are big heroes of mine. It's I was I was saying before. It's like it's kind of what what I hoped my company would become. Like after I'd spent a lifetime building it, but you are the um, CEO and owner of Cannonball Productions, which produces monster events like bacon and beer, spritz fest. And, uh, and then, and that's just your concepts. And then you also build a yeah. uh, client con and then you also produce client concepts as well. So tell us about your business. Yeah. So we, so first, I guess it's been seven years. So we've um, been producing food and beverage festivals around the country. The bacon and beer classic is held in um, major markets in uh, massive stadiums. And we bring in all you know, the most amazing restaurants and breweries, and it's an all you can eat, all you can drink, food and beverage. Oh, so, games and activities and contests and partnerships. And we bring Cornell in. So they bring in black label bacon and they have seven different flavors of bacon. And so people really just get to have it as their ultimate cheat day. And they walk around with like a mini solo cup that's a glass solo cup that they keep for forever. Um, that come in multiple colors now. So it's just, it's, it's a it's a beast. Um, I, and I, actually, awesome. I actually worked that event last year on behalf of a client. Oh, did you? Yeah. So I was I was working for one of your vendors at uh, Bacon and Beer at the U.S. Open uh, U.S. Open Arthur yeah. Ashe Stadium, and it yeah. was yeah, it was an experience. All right, you know, everybody what kind of had this same unified vision of what that day was going to be about, and it was hilarious. And yeah. everybody like was like really did not. They just had a good time. And I, I I can't remember the last time I saw that many people just having a good time. And it was, everybody had this one thing in common. It's, it was an obsession with just like, like you said, the ultimate cheat day. My yeah. favorite memory of bacon and beer though, was when um, anytime somebody would break one of their little ceramic cups that were given, the entire perimeter around them would uh, oh. like, like crowd shame them for breaking their glass. And as vendors, we were supposed to put, be putting their drinks in those glasses, but we always had backups to make sure we, we cheated a little bit too. But uh, I'll I, tell you a funny story about that really, really quickly. Cause you're making me, these are like warming my heart. These, these stories. So we, um, the first year we ever did the first event we ever did for bacon and beer was at Safeco field in where the Mariners play in Seattle. And, um, we had the glass cups and people were breaking them and, and we learned a lot, you know, as most event producers do, they learn a lot from their first event and from their first 10 events, but we learned a lot that first event and, and they were bigger cups and people were the vendor, the breweries were filling them up and we ran through beer really fast and people were getting, you know, really drunk. And so the, the amount of cups that were getting thrown on purpose was excessive and so then we thought, okay, for the second event, we have to get plastic cups or like hard plastic cups that are still, you know, high quality, but that won't shatter. And it was actually my mom who was at the first event who said, I actually think we need to keep the glass because it has this like community building effect of people coming together and chanting when a, cl a glass breaks. Um, we just need to make them smaller. So it was kind of a funny thing. And I, I actually find myself cheering with the people like the shaming, like, oh, I love it. We all carry as no it's doubt. I mean, like, if you can just picture, it's like a what six ounce, five, four, five, six ounce, yep. like ceramic solo cup. Like it looks like a solo cup, uh, and it's branded and it's beautiful. And it's like not something you want to break. But when it happens, people are just like, uh. But I cannot imagine the cup being any bigger than that because, uh, I mean, there is like limitless bacon and limitless beer. Yeah, um, like hundreds uh, of breweries and, you know, styles. And we took over that whole facility where the U.S. Open is in, in Queens. And that was actually, I think we were one of the first festivals to ever be there um, without it being a tennis organization, you know, a tennis um, match or some kind. So it was pretty cool to take over that space because that space is beautiful. 
Uh, I mean, where does it, where does the concept of, of something like bacon and beer come from? I mean, I mean, it's like kind of a gimme that everybody loves beer. Everybody definitely loves bacon. But how are you able to create a concept on that scale um, and convince people to let you have their sacred stadiums? I mean, st- stadiums specifically are very sacred to people and they're yeah. like iconic and landmark um, elements of people's cities and they take they, they like to think that they're you know very personal to them yeah and it's a lot of responsibility to take over that space yeah yeah um, and expensive we so i had this i was working for another company called living social which was like a groupon structured a, a company but they had an event division and so i was running their live event team in the midwest and we were th- hosting we decided to host bacon and beer dinners and it was one of the concepts when when one market hosted something like that, and then it, we would try it out on the West Coast or we would try it on the East Coast, not everything resonated with everyone, but the bacon and beer dinners across the board were, were widely received. So then beer festivals started to become more popular in like 2010, 2011. By 2012, we were hosting our own beer festivals. And, and we threw an epic festival at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. It was amazing. We had 10,000 people in one session first event that had ever happened there like that. And I felt like, I mean, it was incredible, but I felt like the culinary, I'm such a, I love food and like live to eat. And I felt like the food aspect was not highlighted. It was just like a couple of food trucks that were there and they could sell food and the lines were long and it just didn't feel like they were connecting. And so I thought, why not bring in a food like bacon that goes with everything like you can just anything that you put bacon in it makes it better so whether it's ice cream or salads or tacos and Chinese food like anything and it really allowed it was super diverse so it allowed chefs to get creative and highlight whatever food they wanted to highlight whether as I mentioned like different ethnicity you know ethnic background foods or sweets or savories whatever it may be so it was a really crazy idea, but when Living Social shut its doors, they had already greenlit this idea, which was I put together a competitive analysis and a PNL, and there was not that much like it. Nobody was doing it on a national level. And so I said, This is it, we're doing it. And talked to my parents, and they they were retired at the time. And so they said, you know, I think I think you should do it. And we, you know, you can see what the outcome might be. I was also 26 and I was super naive and which was to my benefit because I was just fearless. I had nothing to lose at that point. And I called up stadiums. I just started calling stadiums. And you you were cold calling stadiums? Cold calling stadiums. Yeah. In fact, we had done one festival through Living Social. I'd arranged, it was a glow in the dark 5k at Soldier Field. And it was a 15,000 person event with a couple of other companies. Like with a, It was our living socials event, but we were working on with different production companies. And I, they were my first phone call. Like I already had this relationship built with Soldier Field. And she said, our contact there at the time said, honestly, Kate, like, I think you're in over your head. I love what you're doing, but like call us in a couple of years. And I said, I know what I'm doing. I want to do this. Like we're going to host it at Soldier Field like sooner than later. And we did. We hosted it, I think, the following year. So, but we, um, yeah, I just, and I think, I think the biggest um, piece of advice I was given at a really early stage was to make it, you know, to make it seem like you knew what you were doing. If you felt like a cat and you acted like a cat, they were going to perceive you as a cat. If you felt like a cat, but you, you know, were perceived as a lion, then they would see you as a lion. And I think that was very early on one thing I was, one piece of advice. Was given. So I just made it seem like I knew what I was doing when I was calling these stadiums. And a couple of them said yes. And those were the ones we went to. Um, okay. So we're still going, um, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so you were cold yeah. calling stadiums. Yeah, I was cold calling stadiums. I, we probably, we probably called every major league baseball stadium in the country. And, and uh, a couple said yes. And those are the ones we went for. So that was City Field in New York and Safeco Field in Seattle. So Seattle is our first event. Um, and we still work with the same people and decision makers at Seattle to this day. And New York was crazy. You know, it was big. We ended up taking over two days and two sessions. And just I, I, don't even, I don't even want to think about what the deposit is like in a place like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these seem like pretty, pretty, pretty I was going to say, these seem like pretty capital intensive ventures i mean like you did you take out a loan from a bank or like what how like what do you do on a, on a, on when you're rolling the dice like that yeah honestly we put they were really both 
both venues were really understanding and gave us very, very, they, they, they like structured the payouts so that we would have some, some upfront costs and deposit, but that mm-hmm. the bulk of the, the fee was due closer to the event day. So, so we, um, it was really nice that they structured it that way um, for us, that we were able to have the event. So, God, talk thought, about fearless. My yeah, God. I know. I know. I, I look now and I'm like, what was I thinking? Um, so crazy, but that's so crazy. Cause I mean, like, like with the, on that scale, you, you got to think about security, like the insurance must've been outrageous. Um, even like, I mean, yeah, you, you have to get cancellation insurance in case it rains, right? No cancellation insurance. Not get a thing. Here. No, no, a thing. no oh, yeah. not a thing. I mean, cancellation insurance, like doesn't, it exists, but it's so expensive. And that's yeah. something that like to bring it back to what's happening today, it's nearly impossible for small events to be able to afford or even, you know, like, yeah, I don't know who has cancellation uh, insurance. I know that Wimbledon has it um, because they were able, I think they've been paying $2 million a year for 16 years. So they've paid $32 million, but when they canceled this year, they were able to, you know, recoup the $140 million that they would have lost otherwise. Um, it's a really oh. expensive, really expensive thing to, to, I, I guess I'd heard that the Guga had, uh, had cancellation insurance and maybe that's what, why there's no Guga Muga anymore. Maybe. Yeah. I bet Guga Muga <laughs> did have cancellation insurance being that it was part of Superfly. So I bet, I bet Superfly has cancellation insurance. We just didn't, and, you know, I think luckily like our stadiums, we haven't ever had to cancel anything before COVID-19 um, and stadiums are mostly like covered indoor outdoor they lended themselves pretty nicely to like be weather resistant in some capacities and this, the thing i loved about and love about the stadiums is that it's a one-stop shop so yes it's expensive but they have bathrooms so like the worst one of the worst things about going to an event is waiting in like porta potty lines well at a stadium you don't ever have to do that mm-hmm. um there's very quick access entry access and it's always secure because they have the the machines that you walk through and you don't have to have metal in your pocket They get over, you know, they have all the guards and the hosts and the security and police and everything is there. So we knew that from a safety and security standpoint, we would be in a good place. We knew from like uh, actual space that we could expand into, we would be set. Um, and yeah, so I, I it was expensive. Um, but we also knew that with that came credibility. And I think at that point, I didn't want to just be another event company. We wanted to be the food and beverage event company. And so we really wanted to make the ticket accessible because the a lot of the food and beverage events that were on sale at that time were either the really high end like New York City wine and food or Aspen wine and food that I could never afford, even though I would have loved to attend. Mm-hmm. Or it was like the free carnival style where you would buy a ticket or like the smorgasbord, you know, smorgasburg style where you would just go for free and you could go and taste, but it wasn't a tasting sampling event. You would just buy like a sandwich or, and the food is awesome. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't a walk around, try everything, eat and drink all inclusive event. No so sumo wrestling. No sumo wrestling. What did you say? <laughs> we, we had some, we have some inflatable sumo costumes at our events, um, <laughs> but we did, but um, that I think was um, why we ended up at stadiums and we wanted that credibility. We wanted the nice cups. We wanted, we had a mobile app, like we wanted everything to just scream credibility. Well, you know, you mentioned COVID-19 and, <laughs> yeah. and what does a um, massive stadium event production company do in a world where people can't get together in the same way anymore? Yeah, what's, I mean, I think I mean, obviously you've thought about it. I mean, like, what's I mean, what have you has anything materialized as far as like what your vision is for your company? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, scenarios and options right now. So separately, I've set up a coalition of other ticketed um, event producers and just event producers in general, so that we can be having weekly conversations and hear from some experts. Um, so that's been really inspiring <clears throat> and. It's been fun to, you know, get get friends and friends of friends in the industry together to to kind of chat through all different scenarios and what everyone else is doing. So that's one thing that I've been doing separately from Cannonball. You know, within Cannonball, I think we we see ourselves as having a couple of different options. So one is, you know, yes, events will be back. It will be a while or it might be a while that they're back in the same um, way that they were, you know, pre-March of this year. 
So I think, you know, hope we're excited that people are eventually going to be wanting to come out and, and attending events. Like this. I think we need to be really mindful of the fact that it won't be this year necessarily in the, in the capacity that it had been. Um, but that's not to say that we can't get creative and think of some ways that we can socially distance and have some gatherings of some sort, potentially this year, but definitely next. Um, and we just, we, you know, we're being in New York, I think, especially we have felt the emotional and personal impact that COVID has had on our community. Um, like personally, my, you know, grand grandparents had it. Um, my grandmother has survived and she didn't have symptoms and my grandfather passed from it. And, you know, that puts things in perspective when you're thinking about your company. Yes, it's my, you know, it's an extension of myself and my family, but I think, you know, we're not going to be doing something that puts people at risk. And so we've been thinking a lot about procedures and policies. We've been talking to a lot of decision makers and people who are leading those decision makers to make certain, you know, to create rules and regulations around what will be able to take place. I wouldn't want to put anybody in a position where they, we, we as a company wouldn't want to put people in a position where they would be, um, you know, more likely to spread the disease, the virus or to, you know, get the virus. Yeah. But that being said, you know, I think that there are some really interesting things happening. You know, virtual is happening. I think that there are some pros and cons to it. A really interesting speaker I heard was describing new mediums and, it was fascinating to hear him speak because he was, he said that, you know, when television first came out, they would take the old medium, which was radio and just spin it to be on, you know, now you're using a different medium, but using the old format of radio, but now you're just sitting there with your, you know, your notepad reading the news like you would as if you were on radio. And then you had the web and you would take print magazines and newspapers and just regurgitate what would have been on print, pages, but now you're just putting it onto the web. And now look how far we've come in both television and, you know, online capabilities. And so I think if we take virtual and we're like, well, we can deliver food and we can deliver beer to their homes. And now we have a beer and food fest. You know, I think we're, we're, we're in that stage right now, which is totally fine. And I think it's really incredible how quickly companies have moved to even get to that point of being able to deliver beer and food and have an at-home food and beer festival. But it does feel like that model of like, okay, well, we're just trying to regurgitate what we had been doing and now doing it through a new medium. However, I do think virtual is really interesting for a lot of reasons. One, I think it will be a marketing tool that we can implement even when live events are back. And I think people are more accustomed to it. They're you know more comfortable with it. Um, they have it downloaded on their computers. And so why wouldn't we be able to sell in a partner or chefs and, and highlight chefs and breweries to do a pre-event cooking demo or a, you know, a new beer can release um, that's digital um, to, to share with our community. So I think that there are ways that we can integrate virtual into our like repertoire as we move forward. I don't necessarily know if it's like virtual or bust for a lot of event companies. Mm -hmm. Right now it's just... Um, and something that we can use. Yeah, and, and then lastly, I, I guess I would say... Well, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear about your grandfather. Um, that Thank is, you. That's, um, that's awful. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, you can read about it and then he was fine. You know, he was like totally fine the last time I saw him, which was just a month, two months ago. And he was, he was like, you know, walking around like the mayor. So I think that was really hard. And what people are having a hard time understanding, I think is that like, yes, it's older people who are being more you know, severely impacted. But when you go through it and you're just thinking of your family member dying alone, like nobody deserves to be in that position and nobody deserves to like put a nurse in the position of, you know, I, those nurses are like now like family to us. You know, we call them and we send them pa packages and they took care of our family like they were, you know, one of us. So I think it's just, it was added, you know, added a whole nother level um, and, and at that same time, you know, I was going through, we had nine events on sale when at the beginning of March. And so we had, we've had to pivot, you know, pivot just from those and postpone or, or just hold on new dates. Um, some we have new dates for, but most are just postponed until we can figure out what those new dates are, especially because we're relying on the stadiums to, 
you know, provide us with the schedules. Um, that was, that was so, another thing I was going to ask you about is like, how do you, yeah. I mean, you like batch produce events around the country. So you'll do bacon and beer in nine different markets back to back, mm-hmm. back to back to back to back. And so that puts your, your team yeah. on the road for what? A couple of weeks, a month. Yeah. Yeah. At least we, um, we were supposed to have nine events from mid April. So starting actually April 4th through June 15th, we had nine events planned. We had a couple events on the events on the same weekend. So May 9th, I think we were supposed to have two events. We've done three events on the same weekend. That was that was in different markets and they were all major festivals. So and it, it um we had just launched Seltzerland, which is our newest um festival, a hard seltzer festival. Seltzerland, was, that's right. Yeah. I think I, got, I think yeah. I, got, I think I call it Spritzland or Spritz. Fest. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Spritz Fest, whatever. That's okay. Um, I knew what you meant. Um, so it's a hard seltzer festival and it was, you know, it was on sale and we had great partners on board and it was something our team was just so excited about. And we are excited. It's going to happen. It's, you know, some point I have to talk, stop talking about it, like it's, you know, gone to the grave, but it's, it's going to be great. And we had, I think 10 of those events slated for 2020. So it's just like wrapping those up, dealing with refunds and, and, you know, providing credits to our attendees to use for future events. Um, and then, you know, and, and something we're thinking about, even if we can't have these live events that I was mentioning, is like, maybe we could do, you know, smaller dinners in person, but socially distanced or other, you know, like drive-in style events. You were talking yeah, you, you were talking about virtual and augmented reality stuff. That sounds really interesting to me. I've, I, yeah. I just I, I had a ton of ideas of when you said that. I was like, oh, I mean, yeah, why not? Like, why can't yeah, why, why, can't, why can't you have bacon and beer? Like, like when you're looking around with your Oculus and you look around and say, "There's Pilsner or Kell over there," or "There's Slow and Low over there," and then yeah. have and then a package just materializes at your doorstep that's got a bunch of bacon and a bunch of beer in it. Yeah, um, it would be super cool. I mean, I. I think especially you could have a couple of people around you or there there's so much technology that is coming out of this that we can put people in rooms together or you can select which room you want to go into and you can be in there with your buddies who are also attending or you can be in there with a whole different group of people that you don't even know so that you're meeting people. Um, and I I think that could like really foster some cool interactions and, you know, community networking um, that you might not even get as much as you get, you know, virtually. So. Yeah, like you said, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, yeah. I'm sure we're going to figure something out. Well, um, g- can you tell, I, I mean, I'm just still trying to uh, understand. I never in a million years thought I would be talking to the to the person who produced bacon and beer. Oh um, my gosh. But, but I, remember, I remember like being inside of it and uh, wondering like, how the fuck do you reverse engineer something this massive? And like, how do it's... A really good team. <laughs> yeah, and so, and your, t- your head count is around 10 Small. Like, we're super lean yeah i would say about 10 about 10 and so yeah. you guys come in and then you'll produce an event in different markets and you like you were talking about over a period of about two months is the bulk of your busy season um for for your concepts and that's not even yeah. including the client business and then I, so you, i would say even more than that so it's i would say it's about four months so two months in the it's usually two months in this um for bacon and beer it's mostly in the spring but then Seltzerland is going to be like all year long. We're going to do about two a month for five months and maybe even more. Like that's something that we could scale pretty easily. So if we wanted to do it in, you know, 20 markets next year, we could. Um, yeah, and then we have you, a talk going to feel a festival too. So it's, it's a lot. It's, yeah. It's you do, pretty you, much all year long. You do the North in the winter or in the North in the summer and then the South in the exactly. winter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. To reverse engineer it, I mean, yeah, a really good team, really strong relationships. I think it just comes down to keeping our in mind that like our venues and our vendors um, are really essential. Like we can't do what we do without them. And and so this time, you know, it's as hard as it's been for us. We've been trying to support our vendors as much as we can. Um, so moving forward, a portion of the back directly to them. We usually work with local nonprofits, but we want the money that we you know, we want some of the money that we can give them this year from ticket sales to go directly to our food vendors and our brewers. And it's just, it's a hard time for everyone right now, but we want to try and just promote them as much as we can through our social um, outlets and, and just let people know of anything that new and cool that they're doing, whether it be roadside curbside pickup or dinners once those start happening. Um, so it's, I think those strong relationships are crucial 
And then just getting to be a little creative and think about like, what would you want? What's the most ridiculous thing that you could imagine? And what can we, you know, we have a giant bacon seesaw, which came out last year, um, that you can like, ride um, and it took a gif and, you know, like, or just whatever. And, and so, here's all. Um, so there's, we just try and think of ridiculous things um, as much as we can <laughs> with these giant letters that you can climb on and take pictures of. So I think it's like those, you know, those Instagram moments and capturing them, but also thinking of like just what memories will make the day epic and, and resonate for years in your mind. And our merchandise is pretty sweet. That's another thing. Our merch is our merch is really awesome. We, yes, we, have, bibs, we have bibs for babies and like we have big guys that come up and try and like wear them around their neck for the day. So it's, it's uh, the most right. ridiculous things. That's but so fun. That's what makes it fun and memorable. Um, speaking of fun and memorable, um, I'm a workflow and process nerd. Um, how do you communicate with your team about what needs to be done? Uh, what kind of, like, do you guys use uh, like software for that or? But... So we, we had tried Slack. We do have Slack, but we actually, so much of what we do lives in Google that like everything we have lives in Google. Um, we use Asana, which is a project management tool. Yeah. Um, so we, we kind of were like late to the game in, on Slack. We had already set everything up in 2013, 2014, 2015 in Google. And then we'd been using Asana and it felt like too much to switch everything over to Slack. So we just have honestly still been using Google and Asana. And Asana is a project management tool. So you can set deadlines. You can communicate with each other through platform. You can upload documents. You can, it has a lot of like Slack properties, but it was just something that my team was already really comfortable using. And it felt, I didn't have enough of a reason to switch it over to Slack, but we do use Zoom. We had been using Zoom. So that was, you know, that's convenient for a lot of our phone calls. And then we have some CRM programs like Pipedrive is something we use. And we used to use Zoho for all of our restaurant and brewery databases. Um, Pipedrive is a great program that I highly recommend for really simple, like, management and it's really affordable and i just have loved it from a partnership we keep track of our partners in pipe drive oh pipe drive yeah 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 also, it's great it also embeds with uh with uh, the g suite it uh, does which is, yeah. which is good what do you uh, need? I, uh, I don't i don't need a crm uh i mean it's a, i have a pretty low headcount for for clients so it's like because I, I basically exchange my time for for money <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I don't, so there's only Farther. so many clients i can have for that but i mean we were talking about this earlier and it's, it's just like um you know the the world of the independent hospitality consultant and even to some degree smaller event producers is um, going to be a very challenging world so i've been you know thinking about what uh what the next iteration of my business is, and and I've been in business for myself since 2010, and like we're kind of thinking wow. about we're thinking about media uh, yeah. and content, and and uh, I had this podcast before all this, but um, you know it's 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 just an interesting thing. It's just you're you're just always thinking about what is next, and wow, maybe we, uh, you know, like and I just really love the idea that my idea is my my business is revolves around hatching ideas all the time, and that's why I love about the the story arc with uh, bacon and beer and how it went from an idea for for an old company and then it turned into this thing where you're you know you're feeding ten thousand people in a stadium yeah. that <laughs> never has never had any events in like that before ever. You know, I, I just uh, make it a point to make sure that I'm just hatching up ideas like that all the time. Like I got maybe I got a couple ideas to pitch you. Um, you go for it. I um, don't have tons of time right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we'll do that. Oh, I'll make an appointment. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, and it's like really, it's like the idea and the action behind ideas is is the real currency here. And, and um, you know, I just really appreciate what Cannonball's built over the last however long. Uh, how long has it yeah. been? Yeah, it's been seven years. Seven years, yeah. And it's, wow. I will say one other thing. I mean, like just because we're talking going back to like that time, I didn't leave Living Social. Living Social had closed its live event doors. So we, I just gotten the green light for bacon and beer. I was super excited to get moving on it. We just thrown those big three festivals. Like the, we were doing sumo and sushi, which is funny that you said sumo. So it was a sumo, sushi and sake festival. And then that beer festival at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And then uh, the 5K at Soldier Field. So we had done those in a month. And then had gotten the green light on the bacon and beer classic, or it wasn't called that at the time, but a bacon and beer fest. And was ready to run with it. And then Living Social said, everyone's, you know, done. It was the last day. I think it was like, I remember the day. I think it was like June 15th or something. 
maybe earlier. And yeah, it was right around that June 21st. And it was gut wrenching. And we didn't know what to do with ourselves. And I was depressed. I was like, you know, that was my life. That was my, that was what I loved. The sort of people I loved to work with. And it was just all ripped out from underneath you or me at the time. And so I've been talking to my team, you know, about this and especially our interns who are graduating. I graduated in 2000, December of 2008. Um, very, you know, not similar to now, but, you know, the great height of the Great Recession. Yeah, ouch. And I was let go out of my dream job, which I know a lot of people are experiencing right now. And had I not been let go, I would never have left. I never would have started Cannonball. Um, and so given that I had no other choice and I was like, I didn't want to take another full-time job. I wanted to move to New York and I wanted to, you know, potentially start my own thing. It gave me that opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So as much as this sucks for everyone right now, just start thinking about what you can do and what you can build and what you can contribute. Um, because I think it's a scary time for everyone, but also such an, an amazing opportunity to go after something like a, a little side hustle that you've always, you know, had or a, a hobby that you can maybe monetize. So that's just my feeling on it is, you know, I, I never expected to still be doing this seven years down the road, but I'm really fortunate. Yeah. And if you've ever been to uh, um, any of your festivals, I'm sure that uh, the attendees were glad you did too. So with that, um, you know, if uh, anybody out there has any sort of food centric virtual reality, alliterative titled event that uh, they would love to pitch to Cannibal Productions, how would we find you? I'm around. Um, LinkedIn is a great way. I'm on there like all the time. It's my favorite social media platform. And also, uh, I don't know, you can email us. Hello at Cannonball Productions. I'm checking the customer service line regularly. I like to know what our attendees are thinking and feeling. And I've had a lot of really great calls over the last few weeks with them directly. Um, so they've been wonderful and, and willing to jump on with me and tell me what they're going through and what they want from us at this time. So yeah, so send us an email at hello at cannibalproductions.com and I'll I'll get back to you. <laughs> well, Kate, thank you so much for your time. Um, you, the, the head of Cannonball Productions, Kate Levenstein. Thank you. Talk to you soon. So I think my favorite part about Kate's story is that she was in a career transition at 26 years old and had a big idea and gathered up her resources and just made it happen. We could all take a lesson from that. It takes risk to get the reward and she took a risk and it paid off and she was able to produce these in non-traditional venues and uh, if you get a chance to go to bacon and beer it's a blast i hope that's sooner than later i really hope you enjoyed this episode talking with kate levenstein from cannonball productions Uh, be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary of the show and links to the stuff that we talked about a special thanks to danny messina for editing and post-producing the show if you like the show, you may enjoy another project we started called The Industry is Still. We go live on Facebook every Thursday, and there's a podcast coming out of that pretty soon. We read the news so you don't have to. Head to industrydistilled.com for updates, or check us out live on Facebook every Thursday. I like to keep these shows short and dense. If you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please be sure to reach out to me at Jason Luttrell on Twitter and Instagram, or search for Jason Luttrell on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you've got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing this with another person. If you love the show, please hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating, review, or comment on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I hope everybody's staying safe out there and we'll see you next time on The Latrell Show.